fact, the world around us is fundamentally changing. We may not see it, but the fact is we live in a world that's powered by artificial intelligence. And in this particular presentation, I would like to share with you my thoughts and my patterns that I've noticed for what's happening in the workplace and what's happening around AI. But first, who am I? I've been in the AI space for the last five years, and I've had a chance to work with various companies from all over the world, creating AI solutions that solve various industry problems. And in this process, I've had a chance to work on projects, perform research, launch various initiatives. So it is the reason why I'm here sharing my experience with you. We live in an AI world. If you have walked into this room, you may have noticed Alan Turing, who is one of the founders of AI. And AI as a field started back over 60 years ago. In 1950s, AI was born, and the premise of AI was simple. We wanted to replicate our intelligence into a machine. In 1980s was the second wave of intelligent software called machine learning. If you imagine a robot standing next to you, the robot represents the AI but the brain represents the machine learning. In other words, machine learning is simply the intelligence behind artificial intelligence. Now, in 2010, there came a very critical moment in history. Deep learning was born. Deep learning was a subfield of machine learning, which was able to, for the first time, deal very well with imagery, audio, and text at a massive scale. So since 2010, Companies all over the world have embraced this technology, including Google, Microsoft, Facebook, LinkedIn, every single company you can imagine who is an enterprise, they're already using deep learning and machine learning. AI is often depicted in the media as something that will potentially take over, but AI also has the ability to create many more possibilities that didn't exist I would like you to pay attention to this graph. On the left is the year 1850. On the right is the year 2015. In other words, we have a time series graph which represents the percent of market share of jobs through time. Now, I would like you to notice the blue area. On the left, you have the blue area representing manufacturing, agriculture, and mining. And over time, you notice the blue area actually converges and gets smaller. So what this means is, even though we've had automation, artificial intelligence, and robots for the last 150 years, this particular shift represents the fact that all of these three industries became hyper-efficient. Agriculture is no longer was something that 80% of us used to do 150 years ago. It is now at a point where agriculture is only handled by about 5% of the workforce. Now, agriculture didn't go away, manufacturing didn't go away, but what happened? We've had an explosion of other jobs being created in the process. Everything from healthcare to education to government, financial services. So when you hear the words, AI is going to take over, that's not true at all. AI is going to create new jobs that didn't exist before. And it's hard to see that now, but it is happening. In a nutshell, the world is being run by algorithms. Algorithms is the equivalent of code. And everyone here is really close to Lighthouse Lab, so I can really appreciate that there's a developer-focused group that's, that I'm speaking to today. What that means is everything you do from your day-to-day -day life, whether you're using your cell phone or you walk into an ATM branch, you're using algorithms. Now, there's an important shift that's now happening in the, in the industry, and that is because of the advent of artificial intelligence, the algorithms themselves are changing. And I'll explain to you in a minute. Andrew Carpathy, who is the lead AI developer at Tesla, has transitioned um, in, in his software stack from what he calls software 1.0 to software 2.0. What that means is, imagine as a software 1.0 company, you're creating if-then conditions. We're all familiar with what happens if I do this, perform a certain action. It's a very traditional way of performing programming. However, 
because of the advent of artificial intelligence, we now have a new paradigm of thinking about algorithms, which is it, it's no longer about defining the if-then conditions. It's now defining a network that learns based on input and output. In other words, the program itself is the intelligence. We're no longer defining all of the edge cases necessary for performing a certain function. Software 1.0 is traditional programming. Software 2.0 is deep learning. Here's another analogy to explain what this, is, this transition means. In Software 1.0, you have program and data as the input to the computer. In, in version 2, you have data and output. And what you get is the program and the output. What that means is we're no longer defining every single scenario that can happen. What happens if Tesla is driving itself and it sees some object crossing? We no longer have rules to say move left, break, move right. We have a system that learns through hundreds and thousands of data points and figures out what to do next. Tesla is a very interesting case study for what is happening in the software industry as a whole. Tesla is on the leading edge of artificial intelligence. And they are actually quite um, transparent in their processes. And this is what we're going to analyze today. If you think about the program space as a circle, you have software 1.0 as a dot. What that means is if we want a Tesla to start the car, we create an if-then condition. However, if you think about it, the, the program space is actually quite large. In order to create a, a self-driving car, we actually need to have many instructions for the computer. Software 2.0 is now, for the first time, able to handle a much more complex scenario. What happens if there is a rain, and it's icy on the conditions, and there's a child crossing? You cannot write software 1.0 code anymore. You must have a much more intelligent system that is able to handle this variety of complexity. What's even more important about version two, software 2.0 is that it can optimize for the first time. Imagine we give it a goal. Avoid a collision in front of an, a moving object in front. With software 2.0, deep learning, or neural networks as they're often referred, has the ability to make a decision and optimize itself so that that particular condition does not occur. In other words, we can go from software 1.0, where we have accuracies where they're very finely defined, to version 2.0, where for the first time we're able to achieve 90, 99% accuracy. Here's a great example of a tester in a schematic diagram. On the bottom, we have various inputs for a self-driving car, including cameras, ultrasonics, radar, and IMUs. On the top, we have steering acceleration. So imagine we have these inputs and outputs, and we wanted to create a software that had the ability to drive itself. In version 1.0, we can only define the specific rules. In this context, what you're noticing is w this is what the initial version of Tesla was. So the first prototype that had the ability to do a very basic self-driving capability had this particular code base. In other words, the majority was traditional programming in C++, and some code was in neural networks using convolutional neural network architecture in order to see ahead what's happening. However, with time, for the first time, you had more and more code being taken over by neural networks. And this is the transition that is now occurring. Within Tesla, one of the leading companies who is using AI practically today, more and more code is being rewritten in neural networks. There's a, there's a fundamental reason for that. It is much easier to collect data by observation than it is to tell a programmer, please define all of the thousand edge cases that you must in order to prevent something from happening. In other words, if you put a test driving car and you just let it ride around in snow, in rain, it can actually record what it's noticing and use all of that data to create a much more intelligent software. Now, this debate of human versus machine has been around for a long time. It actually started back in the 1990s. There was a very famous battle between the world's best human and the world's best AI. That was the battle between Garry Kasparov on the left and Deep Blue, which is a I IBM AI at the time. These two players were the best. There was no match that can come close to them. 
And so what people decided to do is put them head to head. It was the ultimate battle between man versus machine. But what happened was that for the first time, machines won. And we were in a slight despair. You know, did machines now finally take over? Was, was this going to be the future of all work, all tasks? Well, I would say that it was a great moment in time. But what happened afterwards was even more profound. Garry Kasparov, realizing that he was playing the world's best chess player, created a new tournament called Advanced Chess. Advanced Chess allowed any player to walk into a tournament with an AI agent side by side. So imagine you would like to play chess, and you walk into a place, and you have a laptop next to you. You are now a team that's battling against other teams. This Advanced Chess, for the first time, was able to prove that people who worked with robots were exceeding the best performance at the time. And I'll give you an example. Gary famously wrote in his, in his book in 2005, and he called this particular realization, a weak human chess player plus a machine plus a better process was far superior to a supercomputer. This meant that at best, a player can know just the basics of chess, but they can have a very powerful interaction with an AI agent, and they can succeed and supersede anyone else in the field. More importantly, a weak player plus a machine plus a better process was superior to a strong human plus machine plus inferior process. So what this means is if a person is egotistic and they think they know everything, they're the quote expert. And if they don't trust the machine to do its part, to delegate the specific part that a machine is really good at, then that human is actually not as good as a person who trusts the machine to do its part. And this is exactly what he noticed in these tournaments. So in summary, humans and machines will always have a very powerful combo when performing any task in the workplace or in personal life. This talk is called The Future of Work. But I want to make a statement that says the future is now. The technology already exists. The world's biggest countries, including Russia, China, United States, Canada, are pushing the lead for research and development of artificial intelligence. The world's biggest countries, like I've mentioned, Facebook, Google, they're all already implementing the technology. And not just that, they're also open sourcing many of their technologies online for anyone to use today. In the future and today, we live in a world where we are amongst robot assistants, amongst robot advisors. This is not something to fear. This is something to embrace. As, we, as we've seen before, if a human player can very effectively work with an AI through a really interesting and well-defined process, they can su supersede anyone out there. <coughs> Let's use what we know, which is People are really good at intuition. We can walk into any scenario, use one data point, and make a decision. Humans are great at this feeling sense. Machines are amazing at calculation. So when I combine the two, when I leverage the best possibility of machine with the best possibility of a human, humans are amazing at strategy. We have the ability to plan ahead and make strategic decisions. Robots are very good at tactics. They have the ability to execute those plans. Humans are amazing experiential creatures. We have the ability to come into any context and have a well-defined experience, a subjective experience. Machines, they don't have experiences. They just have a memory. So imagine a scenario. You pull up your phone. It has all of the digital footprints of your life. At any moment, you can tap a button, and you can pull up the memory bank to when you were five, to when you were two. So this particular scenario is actually the best case scenario. You don't want to, to offload memory to your brain. You want to offload it to a better computational machine. I'll now go over what I believe is the future for humans and robotics. It's time to use AI that's power, that is either powered by machine learning or powered by deep learning. If you go on Google and you search for a keyword like machine learning and deep learning, you'll see a lot of technology-related articles. However, 
as a developer, I encourage you all, or data scientists or designers, to Google what is the effectiveness of being a developer plus machine learning. You'll pull up agents like Kite. Kite is a software solution that sits within your IDE, which is your programming environment, which allows you to, as you type, predict what you want to type next. It's going to look at every single possibility that you've typed before. It's going to look at every single possibility that other developers have typed before. It's going to predict what you want to type. In other words, you as a developer can still be a developer. Now, for the first time, you're augmented with an intelligent machine that allows you to get ahead. Kite is one example of what it means to work effectively as a developer with a machine. Imagine a designer. If you, your goal is to create with a, some kind of a new novel design, well, in this scenario, scenario, you want to leverage some computational intelligence to help you get started. Perhaps you're looking for ideas. Perhaps looking for inspiration. Perhaps you're looking for ways to stylize what you've done and have the machine give you some particular suggestion. All of these scenarios are possible. And it's something that I encourage all of you to do today. Not wait for something that we'll see where you are leveraging AI in the future. You can Google for keywords like machine learning and deep learning and see how AI is playing into a particular role in your industry. I also encourage you all to play with robots. Now, this here is a now, and he is often used as a dancing robot. They are very effective at movement and control. They have the ability to see and hear things. And so this particular robot is about this tall, and so it's actually quite portable. You can put it in your backpack and you can carry it with you. Now, the beauty of these robots is actually they can interact with you, and they can actually take what you teach them and make it your own robot. So for example, there's a comedian in Canada who decided to take a now robot and teach that particular robot through computer vision of the eyes, through the hearing, that the robot is in an improv comedy scenario. So imagine this robot creating an improvisational comedy skit in front of a live stage of hundreds of people. It's already possible today. And simply the developer in, the, in this context has taught the robot through, million, uh, through hundreds of thousands of examples what a comedy skit looks like. You know, there's a dialogue, there's a pause, there is a punchline, right? Every single element can be taught to an AI. And in this context, now is simply the vehicle to what it is you would like to achieve. Perhaps you walk into an office, and then your goal is to think about your day, plan your day. Now robot can actually tell you, hey, by the way, you have two meetings today. Hey, by the way, you have the following emails you must send. So these robots can actually work with you side by side to make you a better person. Now I would like to focus on the human side. Now we all understand that humans are amazing creatures. So we shouldn't diminish ourselves. We actually have many strengths that work very nicely with robots. So imagine you want to be a better human. In a world where you're now running and you're competing against other human and agent players, how do you stand out? In this context, you must be a social human. You must develop your social skills. You must learn to eye gaze, you must learn to pay attention, you must learn to create a conversation, you must learn to put yourself out there in order, to you, in order for you to stand out in, in a sea of other humans. Develop your emotional skills. This is critical. If you're interacting with a human, humans relate to each other through emotions. Obviously there is the conversational layer, however, the emotional side is what we feel. And so if you can have a chance to develop your emotional skills and have a chance to work with a robot side by side, you're now competing on a superhuman level against anyone else who is not doing that. I would like to close this particular presentation with a call to action. Let's embrace AI. AI is there as a friend, as a helper. We can leverage AI's possibilities to do our jobs better. And I encourage you all to go home and really think about what is it that you want to do? You know, what are your goals? What are your aspirations? Well, I can almost bet that there is AI and machine learning models out there that can help you do your particular goals. The technology is here today. The world's biggest countries and, and agencies and governments are already using this technology. So the question is, how are you using this technology? Thank you. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. I am 
IMU is another type of radio technology. Um, I don't know the acronym specifically, but it is something that is used as a way to see what's happening without looking at the camera. So imagine you're in a condition where there is light, there is snow or glare or fog, and you want to move forward without seeing from a camera. So in this context, you're using LiDAR, which is a type of radio technology, radar, and then IMU to see what's ahead. Um, what's also interesting is that these particular technologies are very powerful in that they are able to see things that the human eye cannot see. So for example, imagine there's an obstacle, and that obstacle is a car. And then imagine there's a tree falling in front of that car. So in other words, you're in, a, in your Tesla, there's a vehicle ahead, and there's a tree falling down. Well, with radar and IMU, you have the ability to go underneath the car and detect that object ahead. And this particular combination would not be possible with just camera alone, because all you see is a car ahead. But if you use more advanced technologies, technologies that are available today, you can combine these different inputs as the source of raw data for the AI to learn. And in this context, um, Tesla specifically has chosen these, t these set of technologies to make the self-driving cars. However, uh, I've seen many other companies that pursue the self-driving vehicle. And I can tell you that the, the primary way to, to create a self-driving car is simply computer vision, which is what it's seen ahead. So if you have one or more than one camera that's looking ahead, that's, that has the ability to, s to create a self-driving car. Uh, yes. Okay, can you tell me about the uh, uh, image, the story, some of the articles for other people? They, they don't, I can't Absolutely. Say. Thank you. They don't want to say. Yes. Yes. Great question. So the question for those who are listening uh, on the live stream is that, what is the learning curve for AI? Um, do you need mathematics and, and statistical backgrounds? As a developer, what are your next steps to, in order to get into this particular industry? The learning curve for AI is actually not as steep as you would think. The reason is because as a practitioner, developers are very practical people. They can often leverage open source tooling, which perform the functions for them, which allow the computations to occur. The functions themselves take care of the mathematics and take care of the, the hard parts that you would do as a specialist in the industry. In other words, it is possible today to leverage open source tools and libraries and frameworks that do most of the heavy lifting for you. Now, there is a learning curve behind machine learning and deep learning, absolutely. However, from my perspective, it is not as steep as it used to be five years ago. And the industry is much more defined. There are many more options for you to explore for what it is you would like to solve. Um, the, the trend is that the technology has become easier to adapt as a developer. In other words, it's easier to start today than it was in the past. And that means that um, the only barriers really to entry would be uh, what problem do you want to solve, right? AI is actually quite vast and, and it has a lot of potential for solving various problems. And so uh, there are usually two ways that I think about problem space for AI. And, and perhaps these two insights can give you an idea of, is the technology of machine learning and deep learning best suited to solve these problems? For example, AI has the ability to predict the future and understand the present. Think of it that way. So is there enough data that you're trying to make sense of that is, requires a computational method? The answer is yes, perhaps AI is a solution. Are you looking at some kind of a future scenario where you're making sense of what's about to happen next? If that's the case, and if you have enough data, perhaps AI is a solution. And beyond that, it is possible to go on GitHub, perhaps search for a few keywords related to computer vision, deep learning, and pull up all of the relevant details required to create these models. And more importantly, AI is our industry has a very open culture. It's actually one of the most transparent uh, cultures that I've seen from research and, and, and computer science industry. And there's a very important reason for that. AI has been always tailored um, to the general public. And if the general public has any fears about the p potential of misuse of AI, it is often uh, puts a lot of pressure on every company working on that technology, as well as every researcher working on, on the 
machine learning and deep learning space. This external social pressure allows these developers to open source all of their solutions, open source their mathematical formulations to the, the research papers, open source their source code as well. In other words, the social pressure of us going head to head against machines actually makes it easier for us to get into the AI space because it's easier to look at the open source solutions that are online. Absolutely. Yeah, TensorFlow, uh, so to repeat the question, are there any specific tools that are great for anyone new coming into the field of AI? I would say that TensorFlow is definitely one of the best tools to, to use to get into the field of AI. TensorFlow, for those who don't know, it, it is an open source framework developed by Google many years ago. And specifically, uh, TensorFlow was built to solve problems of deep learning. So the technology I mentioned that came out since 2010. And deep learning is very well suited to deal with imagery, audio, video. And the only requirement for deep learning is that you must have enough data. In other words, you know, if you think of AI as a, as a software, the only way to make that software work is you must have the data. Without the data, unfortunately, the accuracy of the models are, aren't as good. So TensorFlow, uh, as you mentioned, is a great example to use, uh, a great framework to, to get into. It is well supported by the community, by Google and everyone else. It is open source, anyone can contribute, as well as it is one of the most adapted frameworks out there. And uh, obviously, there are many others, PyTorch, um, Cafe, and, and uh, many others. However, deep, uh, TensorFlow is, I would say, the most adopted in the community space. Yes. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is, um, should there be more transparency in the AI models to tell us how they're coming up to their, their conclusions? Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, if you look at the, the world and, and you look at what's happening from the government perspective, for example, the European Union has recently set out laws that require any algorithm whether it's version software 1.0 or software 2.0, meaning traditional programming algorithm or neural network based programming algorithm, the union requires that the reasoning to a particular result must be transparent. In other words, um, the, the government recognizes that yes, there are some algorithms that uh, can be more transparent, but now there are laws coming into effect that say, if you deny somebody of their uh, loan at a bank, you, and that loan is, is guided by an, an assisted machine, well, the machine must be very explicit to say why that loan was defined. And, and it's no longer acceptable for the European uh, community to say, you were rejected, and we cannot tell you why. Um, I would see that in the next five to 10 years that other companies and countries around the world start to embrace this transparent trend of AI. Now, there are ways to make deep learning specifically, which is often considered the black box to, to AI solutions. Uh, there are ways to make this technology more transparent. There are ways to visualize the, the neurons that are happening in between from the input to the output. However, the technology is still evolving, and it is not where we need it to be, where everything is very transparent, but it is better than nothing. Yes. Yes. So the question is, imagine we're dealing with tabular data, um, the equivalent of a, of a data set and something that we see perhaps data that changes over time. So either we're dealing with tabular data or time series data. Um, what is the best technology that we can apply? Would it be deep learning? Perhaps can we look at other technologies or algorithms? Um, deep learning can definitely work in this particular context. But I would say that um, it doesn't have to be deep learning. So 
I've mentioned to you before that machine learning was the first wave of intelligence that came into the scene, and it was around since 1980. So in this context, it's actually, actually possible to apply machine learning algorithms that are able to solve particular problems with a traditional data set or traditional time series data. And in fact, I'll give you one example. At Perduvia, we are uh, currently about to launch a cryptocurrency virtual assistant. So in other words, uh, we are about to launch a virtual agent that helps you to get into the investment space to trade and buy technologies like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. This agent works with you side by side. But in order for us to make this agent intelligent, we must analyze time series data of cryptocurrency prices, volume, blockchain related data in order to predict what will happen next. So in this context, we're actually not applying deep learning for the predictions of what the price will be of cryptocurrency. We're applying machine learning. And there are many powerful machine learning algorithms out, out there that have the ability to make this prediction into the future. Yeah, in, in this particular context, the question is which particular algorithms are effective at cryptocurrency predictions. And we've explored many, but the ones that we focused on were um, related to a methodology called tree boosting. And the specific algorithm is XGBoost and LightGBM. And both are very powerful for dealing with time series data. And we've definitely had a chance to use these algorithms to, to apply to uh, our models, and, and they definitely work. Deep learning will also work, but it's just a different way of coming up with the answer. Inside the big data, yes. uh, at the program that two years ago, from the last week, the CSO, about the uh, deep data from the IBM, and talk about that deep data. I was not aware of that, no. Can you give some context to big data? It's uh, like the <laughs> machine learning. There's a structure program and structure program. There are the combination structure and structure and semi-structure program. And not yet for uh, like that yet. We can to make a statistic on that one. Absolutely, yeah. There, there are definitely many projects that are being released online, including IBM's uh, big data or, or deep data. And these projects are meant to really inspire and, and create a, a new potential to solve various problems. IBM is a very interesting player. You've seen before that IBM was the company that were creating the agent to be the world's best at chess player. Uh, I would say that IBM is still pursuing this intelligence route. And they've restructured a lot of their company uh, and, and their services around creating software solutions specifically towards AI. In their case, you may have heard of a solution called Watson. IBM Watson is their intelligent agent. And uh, through time, they've had a chance to grow the knowledge base of, of the Watson machine by partnering with companies directly. And sort of that gave them the, the training ground for data. And, and, and it is the reason why they're now able to pursue projects like you've mentioned, that because they've collected data from companies and, and had a chance to develop the technology since back 1990s, they're on the forefront of this particular innovation. But there are many other key players in this space. I would say that if you are interested to see like what's the latest and what's the best agents that are possible today, there was a very interesting uh, video that was put online, I would say, a month or two ago. And feel free to Google this. This is the world's best human StarCraft player. StarCraft is a strategy game that you are using your mouse to control certain troops in order to attack another enemy. So the world's best human players were in competition with the world's best AI. This AI was specifically built by a company called um, OpenAI, or rather uh, a company that was bought by Google. My bad. The company was named, um, uh, the D I think it was called Deep Blue. So th this particular company is specializing towards creating research and sharing that research publicly. And in this context, this company has created the world's best AI agent agent that was able to not only meet the world's best human player at a strategy game, and, but also succeed and actually uh, um, win that game. And what was more interesting is that the combination of tools and techniques it used to win the game were actually quite profound. And it's, it's something that we're now noticing a trend in the industry. So before, in a game like chess, the human players would have to teach the agent through various examples of chess battles and chess games to see what, would, what it would take to beat a human player. 
it is no longer necessary to teach agents with exact explicit examples, meaning input data, for what that agent should learn. Today, you have new techniques and new algorithms called, for example, unsupervised learning, or reinforcement learning, or reinforcement unsupervised learning. And these algorithms are very effective at taking in just the very basic rules of a game. For example, in a game of StarCraft, you must click, point, attack. And then it's able to create scenarios, simulations by itself through techniques like um, reinforcement learning and, and, um, and genetic algorithms. It's able to simulate games from scratch, not having observed human players, but simply observing what is their response to a particular action within a game. In other words, today's agents no longer require human data. And this is the, this is the holy grail of AI. An AI that can learn not necessarily through example, but an AI has the ability to learn now through observation by itself. And this is the reason why the best uh, players in games like chess, uh, poker, which is a strategy game, Dodo, StarCraft, are now beaten by the world's best AI. It's because it has this ability to simulate play and play against itself millions of times before coming into a scene with a, uh, with a human agent. Can you fantasy? Fantasy. It's created by AI. VR. VR. One more thing. So yes. Just one thing I love to co confirm because I last time I went to the Google and in my Amazon they don't know that. They just told me I used to not come here. Uh, that one is R N T N. Have you heard about that? A recursive neural tensor network. Recursive neural tensor network. I have not heard of this particular particular architecture, but I'm assuming they're using reinforcement learning, yeah. and they are um, perhaps leveraging the deep learning space to, to optimize the process. Yeah. The future of AI. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, there's many pro po possible and many uh, potential algorithms that have the ability to really fundamentally change how we see um, AI as a space. There was a very interesting study I would like to mention since you brought it up a very interesting algorithm. So this particular study was published by Google about one or two years ago. The, the research paper was called One Model to Rule Them All. And it was this premise that is it possible to build one AI system that has the ability to scan a variety of data and come up with a solution. So imagine we're not building an AI to, for example, classify text or see what's ahead in front of a car, but we're able to take a variety of different data teach AI on various data types, not just text or imagery or audio, but just a variety of different um, file types. And this particular AI is able to now, for the first time, thanks to Google, come up with a result being cross-trained across different domains. Now, this is very interesting in that while the accuracy isn't as good as if we trained a special narrow AI today on any given one domain, for the first time, it's now possible to create an AI that's able to span across multiple industries. So this creates a, a, a very interesting, very promising world where we can come to an agent, like now you've seen, or even a, 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 pepper, a, a different agent called Pepper, which is a robot about this tall. And we can really say anything we want, what, we, what our intentions are, what we would like to do, uh, what we're looking for. And the AI agent, for the first time, will be able to figure out not having been trained on what it is that they're asking for from our request, but from general inquiries, what it is that we want. This is a very promising world where it's a world where we can do things better, faster, more efficiently. Now, I've showed you that graph of where you've had agriculture and you had um, specialized manufacturing jobs become much more efficient. But at the same time, we've had an explosion of other jobs. So keep that in mind. AI is something that is creating a, a new world for us. And it, the best thing we can do is to leverage the technology, not fight against it. Right? If we can work side by side through an efficient process, we can, for the first time, move forward and perform at a sub-human, sub-optimal level. And this is what I encourage you all to do. Yes.
like new resources for you to come into the coming years? So the question is, uh, deep learning today is very uh, powerful and it it's adapted by many countries and many companies around the world. What are some of the possible new technologies that may come into the scene next? I believe that there are subfields of deep learning that have a lot of potential. One example is reinforcement learning, something I've mentioned to you before. Reinforcement learning is simply learning, but without less guidance from us as people, but still performing the function of achieving a certain goal. So in the, game, in the context of a game, that's quite simple. Uh, what is the reward you're aiming for? Perhaps you're aiming to win a game, or um, kill an opponent, or do damage. These environments are well suited for reinforcement learning. And it's actually the reason why reinforcement learning today is being applied to predominantly games. If you look at the, the industry, and you look at what's happening from the world's best AI agents, uh, agents that beat the world's best computer games, including agents that beat the world's best players of game of Go, which is a Chinese game uh, similar to chess. All of the algorithms that have been beating the world's best players were using reinforcement learning. And um, some were using supervised re reinforcement learning, meaning humans were responsible for the training of all of the different environments that the agent can learn. And then some were based on unsupervised reinforcement learning. And I would say that the latter agents that are performing the world's, uh, performing at a subpar level are unsupervised reinforcement learning, which is a, a subfield of reinforcement learning. So if I were to make a guess, I would say that this particular direction is where, um, where the industry will start to shift more towards because of the performance that, that you're noticing in different games. Uh, however, it is something that is still quite new and the technology must be developed further. But there is many promising signs that this technology has a lot of potential. So beyond the games that I've told you before that are now being beaten by the world's best AI agents using this technique, now have the world's best uh, companies release open source frameworks and projects for reinforcement learning, including Google, Microsoft, um, OpenAI. These are all now open source frameworks and libraries that anyone can use today to actually use these techniques for any given scenario. In fact, for, for the project I mentioned to you before, for cryptocurrency trading, um, we plan to use reinforcement learning ourselves. So imagine we teach an AI agent to vary the different indicators and strategies for <coughs> cryptocurrency investments. We can teach it through simulation play, perform back testing through time to see what's working, and then the AI agent will start to learn what's working and what's not. And this is uh, something that we would like to explore ourselves as well. Um, the technology is there. And this, it's also source, open source. So I definitely think the reinforcement learning has a lot of potential. And then beyond that, um, if now games are being won by reinforcement learning at a superhuman level, and it is a subfield of deep learning, now we just need to figure out ways to make the adoption of these technologies easier. Right? Is there a, a, a better way to leverage the technologies without doing as much simulation? Is there a better way to leverage the technologies with, with having less data, perhaps, right? Um, there are many ways to explore, and I think the, the space is quite open. Yes? So what do you think, how far do you think the machine learning and the social learning could be similar? And I could say, well, I can do this problem by myself. Why don't you do the machine learning? Because you're already fortunate enough to have the invention. Absolutely. <coughs> the question is, um, if we have machinery that are very effective at performing specific tasks. And, and in many cases, those tasks can be now exceeding super uh, human performance. Why do we need humans, right? In a, it, what will happen to, to humans as an as a agent? Well, I would say that humans are still necessary. And, and this is something that um, we, we are born into. So we, at the moment, we don't have a choice. However, I see th that there will be a merger between the two, right? So at the moment, we have these sort of what appears to be a separate entity, right? So we have the human and we have the agent. If we can figure out a way to work side by side together, we have a very effective team, right? So the world's best teams are now uh, a hybrid between human and agent. However, there are now technologies that are coming into the scene 
cybergenetics, um, various prosthetics that are now for the first time be able to merge humans with machines together. There are now companies that are pursuing this space as well, including Facebook and um, another company called Neuralink, which is a company that was created by Elon Musk, who is the CEO of the company Tesla. So in both contexts, you have technologies that are now able to directly hook into the mind and the body of the person and work side by side. So now we can delegate something to an AI agent today through a software or a cell phone, through a robot. But in the future, the bridge between delegation will be actually quite closer. Your thoughts will be able to influence the machine through intention alone. You, you won't need to type something. You won't need to say something. You would just need to think something or just have the intention. And that technology is now being released online that has this ability. Uh, they're using the latest techniques of human-computer interface. They're bridging this particular gap of, you know, is it possible to detect neural activity of the mind to detect that signal to see if, if it's possible to control something? One great example is Facebook. They've realized that this shows a lot of promise. So what they've built is a very interesting device that you would put on, on yourself. And it would analyze the neural activity of the mind. And it would tell you what you want to do. In other words, it's using the, the neural signals, the electrical neural signals, to pick up the data. It's applying deep learning to make a prediction of what you want. And then it's able to say, do you want to make a post? Do you want to say something? Do you want to look at, click on a picture? So now the technology is being developed. And, and the technology will become more and more developed over time. However, um, I think to answer your question, there will be a merger. Uh, at the moment, it feels separate. But I think we, we, the faster we can um, combine these technologies, the better it will be. Imagine thinking about some meeting you've had last month. Well, the thought will bring the AI to give you what it is you want to the mind. So that will be a, a world where we are truly being sort of synergistically integrating ourselves with these robots. And at that point, it wouldn't be a war against them. It'll be a collaboration. The best people on Earth will be those who are effectively working together. The best humans will not be the richest humans. They will be the people who are effectively working with their AI genes to achieve a certain goal. So the next question is, you know, what goal do you want to achieve? Right? Because these machines will simply, at the moment, give you a specific output to what it is you want. Right? As a developer, are you looking to write code? Maybe there's an AI agent that can help you write code. As a designer, are you looking for something visually? Maybe there's an AI agent that can help you in that process so that you can now compete against other designers. Yes, that's right. So there, there's definitely a dichotomy, which is do you delegate your intelligence to a machine and um, offload the computation to that machine? Or are you going to be against the machine? In other words, you will not accept the input of the machine. You know, your ego may take over that point, and you may not sort of understand the, the, the value of the machine. So it's definitely a dichotomy between complete rejection or complete acceptance. And it's up to each person to sort of find their, their way in life, right? Some people will embrace this technology. Some people will reject it. Uh, from observation of sort of last 150 years, what you've, see, what you've noticed from the perspective of agriculture is that agriculture improved as an industry. There are less people doing agriculture today than there was in the past. But the agriculture today is much more efficient, right? So the people who are involved in agriculture they're using machines. They're working side by side with these machines. And they're able to produce at a much bigger scale. They're able to supply food to the rest of the world. So today, we have much more options for food, delivery of food, convenience of food. We can walk into a restaurant. We can click a button. And food comes to us. All this wouldn't be possible without automation, and robotics, and, and AI technology. And so there will be uh, people who reject the technology. There will be people who completely accept it. But it's up to each person to, to sort of find their way in life. The best of my English, and you said go to college. How did my professor define the AI? How can you define the AI to do that? To do well, that's called the machine heavy. So the best reason, no matter how they are good, they still have ninety nine percent. What they don't have is the sense of the kind. Mm -hmm. uh, last two years, there's an AI about ninety percent. They said that if the dog from 
<laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's the reason it's a picture of peace. That's a I'm human integrity. No sense of mercy. Uh, absolutely. The, the way that uh, AI is typically portrayed in the media and in movies and, and in scare scenarios that AI will not only take over, but it will actually kill people. It's, all, it's very um, dystopian way of looking at, at the world. However, um, oftentimes this is our fears being projected onto an, a robotic machine that has no feeling like you mentioned, has no sense of care, love, um, compassion. These machines are simply there because we, they were created by us, and now we're simply personifying our fears onto these machines. So we definitely have this mentality of, you know, can this machine go after us? And the answer is um, we don't know whether these machines will turn against us or not. What we do know at the moment is that they don't have intentions of their own, and they may never will. Their intentions are programmed by us as creators. So if our goal is to create a paperclip, well, that machine will create paperclips. If our goal is to uh, be the financial markets, well, you have companies who are in the same race to create AI agents to be the financial markets. So there is at the, mo at the moment, there's always a goal for these agents to pursue. And if somebody were to have a malicious goal, in let's say in the context of perhaps potentially doing harm to people or um, doing something malicious, well then the people and the creators will need to really make sure this is sort of their intention and they probably need to work in, in um, isolation that they probably would not make their intention clear to the rest of the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. From, from my perspective, even though there are people who have dark intentions and that it's always the case, from my perspective, um, because you have a collective human body, usually the collective human body um, focuses on the, the players that are not uh, playing by the rules. And so usually you have a collective body going after the, the malicious people through, through law, usually, through police enforcement. So when you do have a scenario when there's a malicious intent through an AI, I, I can imagine a scenario where there's going to be a gathering and simply just be a, a forced effort. But it's a great question. Any other questions? OK, great. Looks like we're, we're short on time. Thank you very much for coming. Hey, I do have a